So let's take a look at literacy and gender considerations, uh, in particular as it relates to boys in the classroom. First, what are some differences between boys and girls and how they learn? Next, what are some classroom strategies that, that actually might leverage that and support both students, boys and girls, to process and retain information well? Uh, and then let's look at boys here through really three lenses, brain-based learning, academics, and literacy. As discussed in visual literacy and sketch noting, uh, as a way for readers to create visuals and help students remember important information and visualize relationships between concepts, here's an example of a sketch note on today's topic. As you proceed through the content, create a sketch note of your own. Consider organizing yours around the three lenses provided uh, previously on slide two. So some things we know about boys. Well, they have more cortical area devoted to spatial mechanical functioning yet half as much devoted to verbal and emotive functioning. Now this spatial mechanical functioning strength makes them want to move objects through the air, whether that be projects or themselves. Great story about a former student of mine, Joey Worley. Came running into the science lab where we had advisory, flung himself across the table, slid chest first, landed feet first, arms straight up in the air, and said, yes, I knew I could do it then had a seat and was ready to go about his day. Now Taylor noted in 2002 that the male neural and physiological system has less oxytocin. So boys tend toward greater impulsivity, more aggression and less reliance on bonding malleability. Of course, teachers tend to view such natural assets that boys bring to learning as problematic more often than not. Boys have less blood flow to the brain, and according to Rich, 2000, tend to lateralize or compartmentalize their learning. Sachs in 2006 stated that verbal instruction should neither be too long nor too complex. Now, Sachs also reported that teachers in all boys' schools have found that verbal instructions should be delivered in a loud voice, since speaking softly puts boys to sleep and may even demonstrate weakness or inferiority. The greater number of words teachers use as well, <laughs> um, the greater the likelihood boys will tune out. So here's a teaching tip. See if you might be able to give your directions in fewer than 20 words. Now we also know that boys' brains tune into symbols, abstractions, and pictures. Considering these distinctions, boys generally prefer video games for physical movement and, well, let's face it, destruction, and they get into more trouble for not listening, fidgeting, sleeping in class, and incomplete assignments. The U.S. Department of Education released a report in 2004 showing that boys scored 16 points lower than uh, girls in reading. That same year, the National Endowment of the Arts published uh, Reading at Risk, citing uh, that book reading was down 12% for boys compared to 4% for girls between 1992 and 2002. These two reports exemplify numerous studies citing boys' underachievement and ceasing engagement with reading in school. Simply put, Boys score significantly lower on standardized measures of achievement than girls as it relates to reading. And they are also one to one and a half grade levels behind their girl peers in reading. As you look at the NAEP data here, many analysts consider 10 scale score points on NAEP equal to about a year of learning. In that light, gaps of five to 10 points appear substantial. According to Brazo in 2002, boys were three to five times more likely than girls to have learning and or reading disabilities placements in schools. They were 50% more likely to be retained. They were less likely to take advanced placement exams and go to college. And they make up five to five and a half out of six children who are diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. Now, according to Wong in 2018, boys don't read enough. In fact, boys dedicate less time than girls to processing words and are more prone to skipping passages or entire sections and frequently choosing books that are, well, well beneath their reading levels. Smith and Wilhelm documented how important purposeful reading is to boys. Four main principles important to boys for having creative flow-like experiences with reading are a sense of control and competence, a challenge that requires an appropriate level of skill, clear goals and feedback, and a focus on some sort of immediate experience. Casey, Heron, and Wilhelm and Smith all suggested that students should have choice over the text they read and the assignments connected to those texts and the assessment of their work. Choice allows students to read texts about subjects already familiar to them and about which they might have some prior knowledge. 
This motivates them to read more and persist with text. But even choice might not ensure automatically in any way this level of success. Some struggling students claim that they do not like it when they're given a choice. They would rather have teachers give them explicit instructions because it helps them understand what they're expected to do, especially on difficult tasks. Another roadblock to choice is that students may only read familiar texts, once again, that are well below their instructional levels. According to Bose in 2001, the long-term goals of school, like income, security, career, you know, you'll need this one day, are shrouded in adult jargon. In addition, Brazo reported in 2005 that there's plenty of evidence to suggest that many teenage boys are turning off to reading because of actual and likely recrimination from classmates who associate traditional book literacy with schoolboys and nerds, and as a result are labeled as uncool. So what might we do? Let's incorporate abstract arguments, philosophical conundrums, debates. Let's use movement. Use symbolic texts, diagrams, graphs. Do three shorter activities rather than constantly long-term projects. Traditional tests, competitive games. Try those out. And what about the classroom? Well, with 38 students, a horseshoe arrangement is <laughs> a rather challenge, but that seems optimal for boys. Also, maybe more space so they can spread out. They like natural and bright light. Uh, they like it to be a little less cluttered and organized. Um, but do mix up the seating arrangements and the variety of seats. I've built a couple of stand-up tables and a, a low-top, living-edge desk uh, at which students can seat themselves. It, provides a nice array of height and mobility. According to Sachs 2006, an ideal room temperature is 69 degrees. Anything too warm causes them to fall asleep. Use the outdoors if possible. And you know, it can be loud. And in fact, they actually hope the teacher will be. Now, as you can see in this quote here, the only reading that is a, a must is reading what's on a computer or in a football manual. There's no point in reading a book for pleasure. This quote from a sixth grade boy says a lot about the literacy lives of boys. Now what children observed in adults reading out of school had a far ranging effect on their conceptions of reading as a gendered act. Boys are more susceptible to peer pressure as they attempt to ascertain and enact what it means to be male. Boys are generally disadvantaged in academic literacy as a result of curricular emphases teacher text and topic choices, and the lack of availability of texts that match their interests and needs. We also know that it is most often taught by females. Okay? Eight out of every nine in elementary school, and commonly in English, are female teachers, which often deprive boys of male models. At Centennial, where I teach, you can work in an elementary where you have one in two chance in third grade and one in two chance in fifth grade of having a male teacher for the year. Not given that opportunity, you move to the middle school, where the only male teachers in English are myself in eighth grade and Mr. Schroeder. You might enter, enter high school without ever having had a male role model in a significant literacy course. And they're very important for our boys. Take a look at this slide as it shows sixth, seventh, and eighth graders' reactions to the purpose of reading. And now this slide shows the last time I checked out a book from the Media Center was. Look at the cascading effect from 6th down to 8th grade for book checkout with boys. Now a long tradition in education examines the differences between boys and girls on literacy tasks. So let's take a look at four areas. Achievement, attitude, choice, and response. First, boys take longer to read than girls do. They read less than girls do. And they tend to be better at informational retrieval and work-related literacy tasks than girls. In terms of their attitudes, boys generally provide lower estimations of their reading abilities than girls do. They value reading less than girls do. According to Morgan in 2016, boys were less likely than girls to say they enjoy reading, 68 to 82%, and spend money on books, 18 to 28%. Boys have much less interest in leisure reading and are far more likely to read for utilitarian purposes than girls are. Significantly more boys than girls declare themselves as non-readers. And in fact, this is at the 50 percentile by the time they enter high school. Boys also spend less time reading and express less enthusiasm for reading than girls do. Now a longitudinal study conducted by Cush and Watkins in 1996 examined student attitudes toward reading and found that first grade girls uh, demonstrate more affirmative attitudes toward leisure reading than boys of the same age. 
This attitudinal trend remained consistent for three consecutive years. These results are consistent with the findings of a survey of boys aged 10 to 13. 17% were not at all interested in reading for pleasure. 43% were, you know, occasionally motivated to read recreationally. And 40%, in fact, only 40% engaged in reading recreationally as a leisure activity. As summarized by Ferris and colleagues in 2009, overall, boys devote less time to reading, tend to be less competent readers, have less motivation to engage in reading, and do not especially value reading as a free time activity. Now, as you can see in this graph, this is a response to yes or no, girls are better readers than boys. And in this slide, you will see their responses to do you like to read? Again, focus on the yes and no discrimination of boys from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. When it comes to choice, boys and girls express interest in reading different things. And well, they do read different things. Take a look at this graph here from the examples uh, where students say, I generally read. And now in this graph where they say, I, when I read books, I read generally from the following genres. Boys are more inclined to read informational texts. However, on whether that actually makes any difference if the material was fiction or nonfiction, Although it's true that boys tended to choose nonfiction more than girls, particularly at the secondary level, they still didn't read it better than girls. They were choosing nonfiction, but they were not reading it as thoroughly or nearly as correctly as girls. A modest relationship between boys' motivation and their achievement in literacy, specifically reading, is present. According to Bozak in 2011, independence and choice in reading materials were crucial factors in motivation. We also know that they are more inclined to read magazine and newspaper articles, and more inclined to read graphic novels and comic books. As it pertains to choice, boys tend to resist reading about, well, girl protagonists. They're more enthusiastic about reading electronic texts than girls. They like to read about hobbies and things they might be interested in doing. Uh, they like to collect things and tend to like to collect series of books. Poetry is not popular. <laughs> And they tend to enjoy escapism and, and humor, and some are even rather passionate about science fiction or fantasy. Now, this student reflection here reveals a penchant for sports, mystery, suspense, sci-fi, action, graphic novels, male protagonists, and choice and control over learning. Some important response considerations as it pertains to boys in literacy include the appearance of a book, its cover is important to boys. In fact, <laughs> it's really one of two factors in how we most predominantly pick books. First is, does it look cool? And second is, how long is this going to take me? Now, boys are less likely to talk about or overtly respond to their reading than girls are. And boys prefer active responses in which maybe they can physically act it out or make something. Boys tend to receive more open and direct criticism for their weaknesses in reading and their writing performances than girls do, and they actually require more teacher time in co-ed settings. Understanding what students like supports our capacity to work and create the conditions that will make students more inclined to engage in learning and engage in learning what they need to know. To reiterate, Booth in 2002 identified four factors that enhance boys' literacy development. Provision of choice and ownership in their reading, books that reflect their interests and their background, opportunities to meaningfully discuss what they've read, and successful reading experiences.